Testing, testing. All right, uh, welcome to CS 2050. Uh, we're starting a new unit on uh, something called combinatorics. Combinatorics is a big fancy word. Uh, doesn't mean anything. What it really is, you know, it's one of those mathematical spell words. Uh, it's just basically the math of counting. Um, combinatorics for a long time was not regarded as a field of mathematics, right? So there's, uh, within uh, mathematics, you get to play, you know, choose your Hogwarts house. You get number theory, group theory, uh, real analysis, um, geometry, whatever, right? Things, people go off and they specialize in something. Combinatorics is, a, is the mathematics of counting. How many ways are there to do a certain thing, given certain constraints on what that thing is? How many ways are there to make a necklace? That's not such an easy problem to count because if you rotate the necklace or you flip the necklace, but you flip the necklace, it's still the same necklace, right? Things like this. How many ways are there to put queens on a chessboard such that no two are attacking? It's really, you know, it's really, it starts off pretty simple, but then for very, very basic questions, it can get pretty hard, pretty fast. Um, for a long time, uh, combinatorics was regarded as kind of too easy. It was kind of trivial. And it was not regarded as like a real kind of mathematics. Uh, if you were a combinatorialist, people would be like racist towards you because you'd be like, you're not a real, you don't do real math. You're doing counting, you know, grade school stuff. Um, recently, we've seen a lot of advancements in combinatorics. It's like, uh, there are really only two fields of discrete math. There's combinatorics and logic. And so combinatorics is like half of all of discrete math now. Uh, it's well, it, it, we're out of that historical uh, era. Um, you probably have some really elementary grade school ways of counting. One of the reasons I think historically combinatorialists have been dismissed is because they rely on something called a combinatorial proof, which is basically like if you want to count the number of ways to do something, you can count something else and then argue that they're the same way to do the same thing. And sometimes such arguments are not very uh, rigorous, uh, although they are still correct. So combinatorics, I would say this, this whole unit is a little, you're going to have to, you know, get good. It's sometimes based on a kind of intuition that you'll have to develop rather than, you know, you delegate to a theorem that has been proved previously something. It's a little less mechanical and it's a little more artistic. So that's something that will have to be developed. And that'll perhaps be more obvious by the end of the lecture. Um, right, so... Combinatorial proof, one of the things, I think it was on the homework. I don't remember if I actually put it on the homework or not. If you have two sets uh, of cardinality, you know that the two sets have the same number of elements if and only if what happens. Anyone remember? Let's say, and of course, in combinatorics, especially this class, this class and maybe only this class, combinatorics refers to counting finite sets. Forget the infinite sets. Forget anything about these. We have two finite sets, finitely many elements in each. We know that they're equal if and only if what? I don't remember if I put this in the homework or not. Bijection. Yeah, if and only if there exists a bijection, uh, f from a, uh, a to b, right? In some sense, you can like pair up the elements. If this is a and this is b, you can like pair them up. And then certainly they have to have the same size. When you think of a bijection, you should think of this image. It's surjective and it's injective, so there has to be exactly the same number. Um, now, when combinatorialists do the combinatorial proof technique, they often don't mention the bijection explicitly. They say, well, for each way to do this, there's exactly this way to do that thing. And uh, that'll become clear with an example. Right? Questions on just like, what are we doing here? Maybe you shouldn't have questions yet. All right, let's do uh, some small examples. Um, sometimes things are so obvious that it's, they shouldn't even be given names, but they still have to be given names to be called something. This was one is called the rule of products. If uh, uh, there are uh, n ways to do thing one, and m ways to do uh, thing two, uh, there are n times m ways to do both sequentially. Mm 
the word sequentially here basically means you do the first thing and then you do the second thing. Not in some sense that they can overlap in any way, right? So uh, let's, use common, let's use the product rule to determine how many bit strings are there of length n. Do we know off the top of our head how many bit strings are there of length n? Does anyone know this off the top of their head? A bit string is a binary string of zeros and ones. Two to the n. Um, let's do it this way. We'll do it with the combinatorial proof technique. There's many ways to prove this, and we'll prove a second way to do this, in fact, later today. Um, suppose you have n blanks, okay? You're considering bit strings of length n. How many ways are there to pick a first digit of a binary string? Two. Okay. How many ways are there to pick a second digit of a binary string? Two. Third digit? Oh, wow, okay. Well, there's two ways to pick the first digit, two ways to pick the second digit. By the product rule, there's two times two number of ways to pick the first and second digit. When you repeat this application, you're going to product these together, you're going to get two to the n ways. Right? Sort of an easy application of the product rule. Perhaps something you've seen before. Maybe you didn't know it was called the product rule and you've just been doing this, right? Um, does anyone remember uh, the license plate syntax in the state of Georgia? You guys have your driver's licenses? How old are you? Does anyone know their license plate number? You guys don't know your own license plate number? Okay, mine is PVF4880. You guys got to know this, okay? Um, it's three letters followed by four numbers. That's the way license, plate are, license plates are in the state of Georgia. There may be restrictions for government things like, oh, you have to, if it's ABA, AAA, it's like, president. I don't know. But either way, let's suppose we can upper bound the number of license plates in the state of Georgia. It's three letters followed by four numbers. So what we could do is we could draw, we could say, well, let's, they're seven digits long. How many ways are there to choose a letter? Six. There's 26 letters, all capital. How many ways are there to choose a letter? Okay. The third letter is chosen 26 ways. How many ways are there to choose a number? Ten. Yeah. So there's 10 ways to choose a number, zero through nine. So this is going to be 26 cubed times 10 to the 4. Can anyone do that in their head? All right, I wrote it down. I got um, 175 million, uh, 760,000. That's it. Yeah. That's a lot of license plates. Does anyone know the population in the state of Georgia? Five, that's within a significant figure. So it's, it, depending on who you ask, on like a Richter scale, it's correct. There's 10 million people in the state of Georgia. You're only off by a factor of two. Um, if, you, if you can get the decimal digit, that's good enough, honestly. So if we know that there's 175 million possible license plates in the state of Georgia, and we have 10 million people, we're basically not going to run out of license plates ever. We have a good system for naming license plates. In fact, how many cars can each person own? If there's 10 million people in Georgia, we have 175 million license plates. How many cars can each person own? 17, 17 cars. Each person can own 17 cars in the state of Georgia before we run our license plates. Um, we could also adopt up to uh, 165 more million people before we run out, we run out of license plate issues, right? Um, Notice uh, something kind of important here is that it's multiplicative, right? If we only had uh, three letters and three numbers, we would have <coughs> one less 10 here to product. We would have 17 million license plates, right? So we had 17 million license plates and 10 million people. Uh, if we have some sort of exponential growth model, maybe that's not enough soon. Who knows? Um, you add a single digit to the... Uh, number of possibilities that something can occur, you have an explosion in the number of possibilities, right? You literally add one digit, and the number of possible license plates now multiplies by 10. One digit is 10 times as many license plates. That's a lot more license plates for just one more digit on each one, right? This is why they tell you to write a long password. If you can add three letters to your password, and let's say there's, I don't know, 26 plus 26 plus... 10 numbers and ASCII, whatever. Let's say there's 70 symbols on the keyboard you can type, okay? If you add a single, if you add three letters, 
you're multiplying the number of passwords by 70 cubed, right? That makes it a lot harder for an attacker to brute force, insanely harder. So you remember three more letters is no problem. <coughs> the attacker is now faced with a, uh, with a, with a really hard uh, brute force problem, right? There's too many possibilities to check. Um, questions on this example? Let's do a more recent example. Um, does anyone know the, anyone do networking? Anyone know the IPv4 syntax? I'm asking questions I think you guys don't know. Does anyone know the, the standard for an IPv4 syntax? If you have ever set up a Minecraft server, you, you, you go to your router website like that, right? Each one is actually a number between 255. Uh, this is an internal address, but then like, if you go publicly, if you Google what's my IP, Google will tell you it's something like this. It turns out that it's basically 30, 32 bits, right? Um, now, some of those bits are reserved for special intranets and things like this, but we know you could represent every IPv4, IPv4 address as a 32-bit number. How many possible IPv4 addresses are there? So there's two to the 32 possible addresses. By the way, combinatorics, numbers get so big, I'm usually not going to write out the factored form. I'm just, usually it's just too, it's too cumbersome. That's three symbols for a really large number. Does anyone know what that number is? Did I write that one down? I have 4.2 billion. So there's 4.2 billion possible IPv4 addresses, right? That's actually not that many. How many people are on planet Earth right now? 8 billion. So everyone gets half an IP address. Everyone's toaster and uh, thermostat now has an IP address. So it, this is not enough IP addresses. So in like, I don't remember, 2009 or something, 2008, they were like, we need more IP addresses. The internet is going to run out of IP addresses. So what did they do? They invented something called IPv6. IPv6. IPv6 is similar to uh, IPv4 in the sense that it's just an assignment of your IP address. Uh, it can be rep represented as a bit string, and there's, of course, some special characters and things are reserved. But basically, it can be represented as a 128-bit string. So it's 128 bits long. Um, how many possible bit strings are there? How many possible IPv6 addresses are there? 2 to the 128. Yeah. Does anyone know how big this number is? Yes, this is really big. This is bigger. Uh, for reference, there are like 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe, right? You can count 10 to the 80 things, and then you run out of things to count. There's nothing else to count. There's only that many things. Um, you could, how many IP addresses could you give per atom if you had IPv6? Somebody do that real quick. Let's see. I actually don't know the number, but it, just, just curious. Can you give it to me as a power of two? You can use a calculator. Sorry, if we, we have a, do we have two to the 128 possible IPv6 addresses? Routers can do IPv4 or IPv6, but suppose we force everyone to use IPv6, okay? If we were to assign each atom in the universe a set of possible IP addresses, how many IP addresses could each atom be assigned? Less than one. Less than one? We have this many addresses and this many atoms, but there's more atoms than address, there's more addresses than atoms. What is 10 to the 80? That's 10, 2 to the 5, 80? That's 2 to the 80, 5 to the 80? You're telling me 10 to the 80 is more than 2 to the 128? Okay, I got my math wrong. I'll have to double, I'll have to double check that. Forget the IP, forget the atoms part. How many, if there's 8 billion people, how many, uh, okay, let's do it this way. Give me uh, the factorization, the, the, the expansion of 
2 to the 128. What is it, a quintillion, a gazillion? What is the number? Times 10 to the 38. 10 to the 38? Oh, I see. Yeah, that's far less. Um, so how many addresses could we, when will we run out of IPv6 addresses? Basically, we won't, is the, is, the, is the answer. Whoever did IPv6, you know, maybe they were some debatable decisions, controversial decisions. People were like, we don't need 128 bits. That's too many bits. Let's do like 40 bits. Let's do like 80 bits. But by doing IPv6 good, the first time you ensure that you never have to basically make an IPv8, IPv10, IPv9, whatever. There's no other new standard that needs to come along and do something, right? 128 bits is enough. 128 bits is nothing. I mean, like, that's like a tenth of a kilobyte, I think, right? So the number of possible bit strings, the number of possible files of a certain size is far greater than the size of the file itself, right? Um, <coughs> there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of IP addresses, basically. Um, right. uh, let's suppose we have, recall the Cartesian product of sets. Uh, we define a, u, a, a times B to be uh, A comma B, such that A is in A and B is in B, right? And let A, B be finite sets. What is the, card what is the cardinality of the Cartesian product of A times B? We will apply the product rule. So we're simply going to say we want to choose some number of ways to choose an item from A, and then some number of ways to choose an item from B. And notice that the Cartesian product is ordered. right? So if we apply the product rule here to count the number of elements in A times B, how many elements are in the Cartesian product of A times B? The cardinality of A times the cardinality. Um, kind of convenient that it works out for that this way. And certainly you should be able to generalize the product rule, right? If we have the cardinality of A1 times A2 times, times An, this is going to be equal to uh, A1, the cardinality of A1 times the cardinality of A2 times da, 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 times uh, cardinality of An, right? Fairly, fairly simple, straightforward stuff. Any questions on uh, this? Again, maybe you've seen this kind of uh, product rule stuff before. Let's do the sum rule, the rule of sums. If uh, there are n ways to do uh, something, or m ways to also do that something. There are how many ways to do the thing? If you can do something n ways, or you can do it m ways, how many ways are there to do that thing? Well, it can't be the max because it's called the sum rule. So it's going to be the sum of the, it's going to be the, sum of the two. The rule is vague. You don't have to memorize the rule because I'm not, what is a thing? What does that mean, right? Every time you do a problem, you're not going to like delegate to the sum rule. Oh, by the sum rule, it's going to be n plus n. Rather, you'll, you'll just sort of intuitively know, oh, I'm doing this thing. So it's going to be this number of ways, right? Here I add, here I multiply. That's sort of what's going on. Um, trivial example. The sum rule is... Uh, I think far less interesting. Uh, let's say there are eight action movies uh, and three romance movies. Uh, how many ways are can you watch a movie? How many movies can you pick to choose to watch? Yeah, it's going to be 11. It's going to be 8 plus 3 is equal to 11, right? Not the most uh, advanced scientific theorem, but 
perhaps believable. Sometimes you add, sometimes you multiply. In fact, you should perhaps expect uh, whenever there is a multiplication involved, or perhaps there's also addition involved. Right? In fact, these two share a uh, duality. This is more of a general comment than something specific about combinatorics. But in uh, basically any system, we have a, something like a conjunction, and then we have something like a disjunction. Right? In arithmetic, we have multiplication, and we have addition. In, that's true in numbers. You have those two basic operations. Uh, in some sense, those are the only operations. In uh, logic, you have a conjunction and you have a disjunction, right? In set theory, you have an intersection and a union. These are all the same thing over different contexts and different objects. This is all the same item. These two things, the multiplication and the addition, have a yin-yang always, right? So whenever you see one, you perhaps should expect the other to appear, right? We did a product rule. There has to be a sum rule in combinatorics. Combinatorial theory will be built upon having alternating of these two rules. Okay. Questions on that? Does anyone remember the inclusion-exclusion principle that we proved? We proved this using elementary set theory, but let's uh, discuss it in more depth, because now we can use it uh, effectively. Inclusion-exclusion says what? Off the top of their head, does anyone remember? cardinality of A union B is equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the cardinality of the intersection of A and, and B. Basically, the proof was that this is like, well, when you count A and B, you sort of double count everything in the intersection. So you need to subtract the intersection off one time. So you're not double counting it. You're single counting it. Here's sort of a combinatorial proof of this. Consider A intersect B, excuse me, A union B. We wish to count the number of elements in the uh, A union B is going to be this double shaded circle area, right? That's A, that's B, it's going to be this part. That's A union B. We don't want to double count any element of A union B. We just want to count each element in A union B one time. Here's how we're going to do this. Consider I draw it again. Now when I add uh, the cardinality of A to my sum, I'm counting everything that's in A. One time, right? That includes everything in here and everything in here. Everything in those two sets has been counted exactly once, right? Now, when I add the cardinality of B to my sum, I'm counting everything that's in B. So again, if this is A and this is B, this is, uh, yeah, this is, uh, I'm counting everything in here once, excellent, but I'm also counting everything in here once, right? So notice that I've counted everything in A not B once, everything in B not A once, but I've counted everything in A intersect B twice. So I need to subtract off exactly what I've double counted, which is going to be the intersection A intersect B, which means I'm going to say minus 1 there. And then there it's just one, each, in e, everything in each has been counted exactly once. Right? Questions on this? We gave a, a proof of this with using set identities instead, right? Using Laws, De Morgan, whatever, right? Distributive stuff. Um, we've seen this before, right? Um, did you know this generalizes? Uh, suppose we had three sets. Suppose we have A, B, and then we also have C. What would we guess the formula is for the cardinality of A, union B, union C? You're so close. You're off by one thing. Plus the intersect. Plus the intersection of all three. This is a big, ugly, long formula, and but we'll prove a generalization of it that is a little nicer to write. But before that, let's prove the case of three. Let's try to combinatorially prove the case of three. Okay? When I write the sum, I'm just simply going to take my diagram here. I'm going to redraw it a little bigger, and I'm going to add a dot every time I add something, and I'm going to cross out a dot every time I subtract something. Okay? A, B, C. Then we're going to ensure that for each of these sections, there's exactly one dot in each section. Okay? When I add the elements of A, I'm going to put a 
I'm adding things in here. Okay. When I add the elements of B, I'm adding things in here. When I add the elements of C, I'm adding things in here. I have double counted the intersections of every two sets, and I've triple counted the triple intersection, right? To give you a hint about how the proof of by induction might go. Um, well, so let's just start removing things. Well, if we take A, we're going to subtract off A intersect B, okay? That means we're going to remove one item from A intersect B. We're going to subtract off B intersect C. So we're removing one item from B intersect C. And we're going to subtract off A intersect C. So we're removing one item from A intersect C. Okay? This one item, this had two items, but now we removed it. So now it's got one item. Well, one uh, double, not double counted. It's counted exactly one time. This one has been now counted no times, though. We removed too much of it. We, it was triple counted, and now we untriple counted it. It means we didn't count it at all. So unfortunately, we have to count it. So we're simply going to put a dot back in there. Here we do. That's why the formula works, right? Combinatorial proof. Um, you could prove this with set identities. I don't recommend it. It's complicated. We should see a pattern, though, right? The, L, the sets of one, we just add them. Then the intersections of sets of two, we subtract them. Then the, inter then the intersections of sets of three, we add them. That's sort of a pattern. So if we were to give a pattern for the inclusion-exclusion principle, it might look something like this. First of all, it's going to be an alternating summation, right? So the cardinality of uh, the union of i equals 1 to, let's say, n of a i. So we're unioning uh, n finite sets together. We want to count the cardinality of them. They may overlap or something. So we're going to do our inclusion exclusion, generalized inclusion exclusion, to try and figure out a form of this. Well, first we need to simply add in all the sets, right? So this is going to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the cardinality of a i, right? Now we need to subtract off the intersection of every pair of sets. Minus, and the way I'm going to write this, uh, from 1 less than equal to i less than j less than equal to n, uh, we're going to subtract off the intersection of a i intersect a j. Right? Um, then I'm going to add in. Uh, for all triples of sets, 1 less than equal to i less than j uh, less than k less than equal to n of a of i intersect a of j intersect a of, a, a of k, right? But now I have added that back in, and suddenly I've uh, overcounted. I need to now undercount again. So what we're going to do is just dot, 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 and I'm going to say the last term in this is going to be, it's going to be a positive or a negative. Right? The way we can represent that is by putting a negative 1 to a power, because that's going to always alternate. So it's going to be negative 1 to the something times simply the sum of the intersection of the last set, which I have as um, intersect i equals 1 to n of a i. Right? But what is the power of negative uh, 1? Do we know? Well, let's see. Um, the first one, the sets of size, the one sets were like positive, two sets were negative, three sets were positive, four sets were negative. So it's like if n is even or odd, right? If n is even, it should be negative. So I'm just going to say this is going to be n minus 1. It's the last step, whatever that is. Right. That is an, a long and ugly formula, and you'll never have to use the generalized inclusion exclusion principle, but it's important to think combinatorially about how we generalize inclusion exclusion from 2 to 3 to 4 and so on, right? Questions on this? Let's do an example. Um, how many numbers 
between uh, 1 through 100 are not divisible by 2, 3, or 4. Excuse me, 5. Let's do 5. So we want to count the number of numbers between 1 through 100. There's 100 of them. Certainly. We want to count the number of numbers that is not divisible by 2, 3, or 5. All right? We can actually do that by counting the number of numbers that is divisible by 2, 3, or 5. And then we can subtract 100 from that. So if, instead of counting the way something is not divisible by something, which is a little difficult, we can use basic set stuff and inclusion, 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 exclusion to count the number of ways something is divisible by something. So we're, we're going to take that inclusion, exclusion for just three sets and apply it here, right? Let uh, A be the number of ways that something is divisible by 2, the number of numbers between 1 through 100 that is divisible by 2. What is the size of A? How many numbers between 1 through 100 are divisible by 2? 50. 50. How many numbers between, um, uh, how many numbers between 1 through 100 are divisible by 3? This one took me a second. 33. 33. Yeah, you got to round down. You do 100 over 3, divide to round down, right? Because the 33rd one is going to be 99. 102 won't be in there, right? What about the number of numbers between 1 through 100 that's divisible by 5? 20. Okay. All right. What are the number of numbers that is divisible by 2 and 3? If something is divisible by 2 and it's divisible by 3, what do you know it's divisible by? 6. It's divisible by 6. How many numbers between 1 through 100 are divisible by 6? 16. 16. You do that quick. Wow. Okay. How many numbers are divisible by 2 times 5? How many numbers between 1 through 100 are divisible by 10? Uh, how many numbers between 1 through 100 are divisible by 15? 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90. That's it. Okay. How many numbers are divisible by all? What are they? So that's 2 times 3 times 5 is 30. So we have 30, 60, 90. We have a bunch of numbers here. We want to consider the number of numbers that is divisible by none of them. So if we're drawing a picture, we have something that looks like this. So here's our, our A, B, and C, right? What's the number that's not divisible by any of those? Let's say, I don't know, 7. 7 would be out here somewhere. Um, what's the number divisible by all of them? 30. Let's put 30 here, for example, right? We want to count the number of numbers that is divisible by none of them. So we're trying to count the shaded region here, right? So what we're going to do is apply inclusion exclusion to compute the union, which is this triple Mickey, and we're going to subtract 100 minus that, OK? So let's set up our inclusion exclusion. The cardinality of A union the cardinality of B, excuse me, A union B union C, the cardinality of that is equal to, by inclusion exclusion, cardinality of A plus cardinality of B plus cardinality of C minus the cardinality of A intersect B, minus the cardinality of A intersect C, minus the cardinality of B intersect C, plus the cardinality of A intersect B intersect C. I'll also tell you, this general formula is the general formula and no one memorizes it. That's the, one of the reasons proof is so important, because you should be able to be like, if you understand really how inclusion works, inclusion exclusion works, you never have to memorize anything. Just rederive it. Here I was like, okay, I'm just, I know I'm going to choose the ones, alternate the twos, alternate the threes, and so on, right? It's not too hard to remember how to derive the formula. The actual formula doesn't really matter, right? Let's just plug and chug our numbers. We have 50 plus 33 plus 20 minus 16 minus 10 minus 6 plus 3. Someone can work that out for me. I have an answer, but I just want to see if you guys got the same thing. Double check me. Seventy-four. So we know that the cardinality of A union B union C is seventy-four. So that's the number of numbers that are that's divisible by two or by three or by four. And we did inclusion exclusion to make sure we didn't double count anything, right? 
6 would not have been double counted. That's why we did the minus 16 there, right? Um, how many numbers are not divisible by 2, 3, or 5? 26. 26. 100 is the total number of elements that is spread across the universe here. Minus the 74 is going to give us 26 possible numbers. And I think if you plug that into a calculator, you'd manually do it, you'll see that you get 26 out. Questions on that? Yes? So what does the 7 represent? The 7 is like, so there's, we're considering the set of numbers 1 through 100, right? So I'm like, if I were to put the numbers here physically, where would they go? What's something divisible by 2? 2, OK. What's something divisible by 3? 3, 5? Uh, let's say 10 goes here. Uh, so does 20, right? It's like, where do you put the, the numbers themselves, right? Um, 30 goes between all of them. What goes between B and C? Let's say 30, uh, 15, 45 also goes here, right? Stuff like that. So like uh, we're trying to count. 7 is divisible by none of them. So 7 is definitely one of them. Certainly the primes. So it's, it, it's not like the amount of numbers, it's just a number. Yeah, yeah. Think of it like an item, right? The element. Yeah. That's the, we're trying to count the outside region. Yeah. Yes? Right. So we want to, when we write out the formula, sometimes you just got to have to like generalize. So this is the formula for case two. What we do is we add the sets, subtract the intersection of all possible pairs. So when we say i less than equal, le, one, i and j are between 1 and n, but they're not equal. Because you don't want to intersect ai with ai, because that's ai intersect ai is just ai. So we're really counting distinct pairs. We're not doing a intersect a. It's a, b, b, c, and ac, right? So we want to consider all possible numbers between 1 through n that are not equal. So if j is n, 1 can be 1 through j minus 1. It just can't be n. Right? It can be any others. That's the, what that notation means. You can really think of that as like a double for loop for i and j, but i does not equal j. That's really what this says. Same thing here, i, j, k, doesn't really matter which one is which. And because a intersect ai intersect aj is the same as aj intersect ai, it doesn't particularly matter that we force the order this way. This is a convention. It's also one of the reasons that I don't really, you should not care too much about memorizing the above formula. You'll never have to be like, let me compute the intersection of 17 sets in a weird way, you know, something like this. There's probably easier ways to go about it. Questions on this? All right, let me give you one last little tip on an efficient way of counting some things. We take a little break. And it's that sometimes you want to count things that are like um, uh, not obvious what the structure is. Like it's not immediately, sometimes when you apply some rule and product rule, you have to break things up into things. For example, we said uh, that there are, if you have eight action movies and three romance movies, there are 11 ways to watch a movie. But what if you're considering the number of ways to watch a movie and eat a snack? What you would do is have to break that into the product of the number of ways to watch a movie times the number of ways to eat a snack. Then you would break the number of ways to watch the movie up into the sum rule. So you would break it up into product rule, break that into sum rule, and then you may have to break that also into product rule. And then f further more, I think w one of the weirdest problems I saw in the book was like, you have to break it up like five times. Product rule, sum rule, product rule, product rule, sum rule, something like this. It was not uh, a clear problem, but that's sometimes what's required. What you can also do is organize the number of possibilities as uh, a tree in, in terms of decision making. So let's consider uh, the number of bit strings of length 4 with no consecutive ones. So we're considering bit strings of length 4. So they're 0, 0, 0, 0 all the way through 1, 1, 1, 1. But none of the strings that we want to count can have two ones touching each other. If they have two ones, the two ones are very far apart. Let's do this the hard way. How many bit strings are there of length 4? I'm going to write out 16 bit strings. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 
one 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 zero 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 one zero zero one one zero one zero one zero one 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 zero zero one one zero one 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 zero one 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 okay is that sixteen four eight twelve sixteen okay there's sixteen numbers just increment the truth table in binary um, all right let's cross out all the numbers that have ones touching these don't have any ones touching these have a, this has two ones touching so we're just gonna cross that out uh, that is one, two ones touching two ones are touching two ones are touching Ones are touching, ones are touching, ones are touching, ones are touching. We're left with how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we got eight. eight. Eight of them are consecutive. Now, when you have something larger than this, it's a little, I mean, how many bit strings are there of length then? There's two at the end. You don't want to write out two the end bit strings. It's better to organize your thoughts into a decision making tree. So, first, we start with no decisions have been made. Right. But first, we want to make a decision on the first bit. By the first bit, I mean that one. Right. How many ways are there to choose the first bit? Two. It's either one or a zero. Right. Now, the number of ways to choose the second bit is actually determined by the number of ways to choose the first bit. So we're basically going to make a really complicated if-then, like nested if-then thing, enumerating all possible ways. If you choose a one here and you choose a zero here, there's two ways to do that. Now, if you choose a 1 as the first bit, how many ways are there to choose the second bit? 1. What is the second bit? Zero. Yes. If the first bit was a 0, how many ways are there to choose the second bit? 1 and 0. Okay. So if you only ask bit strings of length 2, there's only three ways. How many, if you choose the first bit to be a 1 and the second bit to be a 0, how many ways are there to choose the third bit? Two. Two. If you choose the, th the first bit to be a zero, the second bit to be a one, how many ways are there to choose the third bit? Zero, yeah. How many ways there, if you choose zero, zero, what's the possible choices for the th third bit? Yeah. Okay, let's send it home. If you do one, zero, one, what are your choices for the second bit? Hold on. Uh, you can't choose one, so you have to choose zero. Yeah. Notice that if you just if the last digit was a zero, then it's just going to be two, right? Zero is going to be two. One, you can only choose a zero. Zero, you can choose two. Okay. Now, how many leaves are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And in fact, each leaf corresponds to a possibility. Um, what's the what string does it actually correspond to is the path you take uh, on the decision tree, right? So this, for example, corresponds to 1, 0, 1, 0. This corresponds to 1, 0, 0, 1, right? And so on. From there, it's easier to organize. I mean, technically, it's the same amount of things. Uh, but it's a little easier to present and keep, keep track of certain things, you know? You don't want... A thousand length kiss uh, kit uh, switch case when you can have a few nested if statements, right? It might be a little easier that way. Um, things like that. Questions? Just sort of a, maybe a little helpful technique. Okay.